Um, we're now going to move on to last but by no means least, our final speaker, Zainab Asan Ramu. Uh, Zainab is an activist, writer, and former parliamentary researcher and advocate for human rights. She's worked um, within the charity sector, including for Amnesty International. She's currently BAME officer in her CLP, um, and she's a graduate of the Bernie Grant program. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Zainab for some words about her experience. Hi, everybody, um, and thank you so much um, for inviting me um, to speak alongside this esteemed and very impressive panel. Um, <laughs> it's been amazing to hear about each of your journeys and um, hopefully share some of my own experiences with you. So I guess I also had a bit of a convoluted journey. Um, so I um, went to the University of Leicester um, in 2008, I believe, and um, in 2008, and I went to study English language and literature. Um, but before then, um, so, you know, actually, let me skip back a bit. So before I even, went to university i went to um, um cambridge college of art not cambridge sorry it's camberwell college of arts because i thought i wanted to be a graphic designer so it kind of just shows you uh, the the different the different areas um that i've kind of been in so i thought i wanted to be a graphic designer that didn't work out and my second passion was english language and literature so that's what i went to go on and study in the back of my mind i always knew that i had an interest and a passion for human rights and for politics, but I didn't want to study any of those subjects, and I really didn't want to study um, law either, which would have been a great path into um, human rights and some of the different careers um, in, in, in that sector. Um, so I just went on with my, my, my studies. I became the ACS president and did lots of kind of events um, at university, um, lots of um, networking um, with different organizations to try and get um, you know, people from within the ACS connected to the corporate world and the corporate sector um, and just lots of lots of kind of projects like that. Um, soon after I graduated from university, I, you know, I had decided my final year was basically looking at the human condition within literature. So looking at the civil rights movement, um, looking at um, women um, and their rights through literature. Um, and so um, from that point, I, I kind of had an inkling. I said, OK, great. I know I need to now go and study um, a master's um, because Again, at university, I got really, I got a little bit, I had a taster for Amnesty International's work and what they were doing. And I was like, that's absolutely where I want to go and kind of build my career in human rights. Um, so I knew that in order to really get into that sector, it was important for me to have to have another academic string to my bow. And I decided that was a master's in international politics and human rights. Um, but I needed to save. So as soon as I graduated from university, I fell into recruitment because that was the, the, the jobs that were hiring at the time. Really hated it, wouldn't recommend. Um, um, it, was, it was something that I didn't really like, but it did enable me to save a little bit. Um, and then I had the opportunity to start volunteering actually at Amnesty International and I was the Media Awards assistant. And the Media Awards is an event that Amnesty throws every year to celebrate um, journalists' engagement with human rights issues across the globe. Um, and it was phenomenal. It really just cemented, I think, um, my my thinking that this a career in human rights is absolutely what I wanted to do. I got the opportunity to meet, you know, amazing people like Jon Snow, and that was amazing. And we, you know, we had conversations, but just like really dig into the work that Amnesty was doing and dig into, you know, um, journalism and the ways in which we need a journalist to ensure that they were constantly shining a light on human rights issues as part of you know amnesty's long-term um, vision to do campaigning and advocacy work um, and I, I stayed um, in the they were called the brand and events team so I stayed in that team for about a year volunteering so after the media awards ended I switched into um, just artist liaison work um, and building up amnesty's kind of celebrity uh, celebrity relationships and, and, and working alongside the amazing um, artist liaison um, manager at the time and then um, Amnesty started recruiting internally for a role in the fundraising team 
Um, and at that point, I'm going to, um, you know, completely um, mimic what Imran was saying about networking. I made sure that when I was in, at Amnesty, that there was nobody that I, like, I spoke to everybody. I spoke to every single person in every single team, not just because I was just a friendly person and I just liked to know who was who but because I knew that eventually my you know my interest areas were definitely in the advocacy team and the research team and the campaigns team and I really wanted to start start building relationships with those people so I just started talking and talking to lots of different people um, so the role for in the fundraising team came up and it was about it was a, a trust and corporate relationships role and it meant that I got to um, write funding proposals for Amnesty's campaigns research uh, um, and basically try and secure funding for each of those things. Um, what was great about that particular role, at the time I thought it was, you know, so far away from where I wanted to be, but actually the skills that I learned in that role were next to none. I was able to talk to directors and researchers who are, had been doing, you know, human rights missions on the ground um, all over the world and really get into their heads about, you know, what it was like to do what they were doing, but also obviously finding out about the projects and the programs so that I could write about it. But it gave me the skills in kind of condensing really complex human rights issues into content um, that everybody, that was readable by everybody, regardless of um, age um, or re regardless of status in terms of, you know, a lawyer could read it or a, a, somebody, a, a student at school could also read it and understand what Amnesty's work was. So I kind of gained that skill of, you know, write communi written communication skills, how to write persuasively, how to um, do research and condense research into bite-sized bite chunks. So I did that for about three and a half years and again I didn't stop networking I always I always always knew that I wanted to work get a taste for campaigns get a taste for research get a taste for advocacy work um, and so I went over to my friends in the campaign team and I just said to them listen I would really love to um, shadow you for a little while just to understand what it's like to be a, an effective campaigner and work on some of the campaigns that you're doing um, and they said yes um, and so I started um, still working in the fundraising team. I condensed my hours so that I could spend one day a week in the campaigns team. And I was working with them on their human rights defenders work, um, the, the beginning parts of it. So like gathering information, um, just as they were starting to launch the campaign and figure out what it was that they wanted to do um, and the different areas that they wanted to focus on. So one of the focus areas was women human rights defenders and the ways in which that they were being attacked. Um, in the line of their work, especially digitally, but also threats physically on the ground, etc. I spent, I think maybe, I can't remember how long I spent there. I was there for a little bit. Um, and then I was like, okay, great. I've had enough of campaigns now. It's great. They do amazing work, but I'm not sure if it's exactly what I want to do. And so I then um, went over to speak to my friend at the International Secretariat, who was a researcher. That was another area that I was really interested in. And I was like, okay, great. I really, really, really am interested in um, research and how human rights um, research and, you know, um, how you do it, where do you start um, and stuff like that. And at the time she was working on um, Amnesty's research, looking at the ways in which women are abused or violated online. Um, so most, some of you might know uh, or, or might have heard of the toxic Twitter campaign. Um, so I got to be a research assistant on that really innovative, really intersectional, really groundbreaking piece of research. And it was the research that um, found out that Diane Abbott um, MP was the, um, the woman MP that got the most abuse in the run up to the 2017 general election. So it was just, it was, it was phenomenal. I had such a, a great time um, there. Um, it got to a point where they offered me um, an opportunity to work. Um, so I had been volunteering, but they gave me an opportunity to work two days a week, paid as a research consultant on that role, on that on that mission. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to take it up because of um, the Amnesty International UK said I couldn't take it up. Um, because of logistics um and so at that point i was like okay great so i can't now go and do you know human rights research and a really amazing piece of research that i've been working on for a while and i think at that point i knew that it was time to stop thinking internationally and start thinking more locally so i had been you know working at amnesty thinking about what's happening in nigeria what's happening in the middle east what's happening in brazil you know what are all the different human rights abuses that's happening there and i didn't necessarily i wasn't being 
I wasn't thinking local enough, so I wasn't thinking about necessarily what was happening in the UK, what was happening to people in my communities. Um, and so I started looking around for different jobs. And at the time, my local MP was recruiting for a parliamentary researcher. And I thought, oh, great, this is amazing. This is a great you know, leap. I can go from working in a great institution like Amnesty, but working more local, working for my community, in my community, in a, the great institution that is Parliament, and, um, and do some great things. Um, and so I applied and I just spoke up. There's so many transferable skills I'd learned at Amnesty as a fundraiser, as a researcher, as a mini campaigner, even working in the brand and events team that I was able to use in my interview to show <laughs> my member that I would be a great addition to her team. And the fact that I was also a constituent, I think worked in my favor just because I knew the area really, really well. And what I will say is at the time I was, I've always been a Labour voter, but I hadn't been, I had never been a Labour member. So I think maybe, maybe three or so months before I even saw that job, I, I had decided to take the leap and become a member. So by the time I had interviewed with um, my member, I was a Labour member, um, but I, I hadn't attended any CLP meetings or anything like that. I just knew because I lived in the area I knew what the issues were I, I could talk about them very very fluently and articulately um, and then um, working as a parliamentary assistant um, and researcher um, I just became instantly so involved in local politics I don't know what happened it's like I kind of woke up um, and went from human rights to politics minded politically thinking politically um, overnight and um, I stood for election in the local in my local CLP no one knew me um, at the time I think maybe a couple of people knew me because I was friends with one of the councillors and obviously my member knew me um, but it was quite nerve-wracking getting up and trying to convince everybody in the CLP that even though they hadn't seen me before that I be a great fame officer um, and luckily for me I just had had um, lots of experience in the past doing that kind of role so at university I was the ACS president um, at Amnesty I was part of the BAME network and the BAME forum and held lots of events and tried to you know do lots of stuff there and I was a union rep so I had experience in representing demographics of people um, and I was successful and I got it um, so I guess I should probably talk a little bit about my role um, in Parliament and what I was doing with Theresa so a lot of my work included producing policy responses for constituents so lots of people would write in and say you know I want Theresa to write to um, the Prime Minister and talk to um, the Prime Minister about X, Y and Z and so I'd be the one to go back to them and say well I you know I probably won't write to the Prime Minister instead what I can do is direct your question to the actual Secretary of State or the Minister in charge of that particular area so it's not managing expectations you know lots of people would write up with really um extreme things that they wanted me to do and I had to kind of be like oh well I don't think Theresa May or Boris Johnson who's now our Prime Minister is really gonna you know accept a letter from my MP directly to you it's probably better for me to redirect you to someone who'd probably answer it because they know that area very well um I also did um quite a few speeches um wrote lots of briefing notes for my member so whenever she would go into um um, the chamber to talk I would you know draft interventions for debates that she'd be attending um, I would make sure that she had key points that she could then just create interventions for on like when she got there and um, which was really interesting um, I also drafted parliamentary questions um, she tended to do her own oral questions but um, the written ones I would submit online um, on behalf of constituents but also if she had a particular area that she was interested in um, I would submit those um, when I first started actually the, the first big project that I got involved in was a summer school for young constituents in the in the area and getting them to understand what the role of a uh, their MP was, what the role of um, the mayor was, or their London Assembly members was, um, what the role of their councillors were, and getting them to understand the political process, which was amazing and so up my street because I'm so passionate about getting young people and people from underrepresented backgrounds engaging in politics. Um, I also did lots of um, press releases for her, updated her diary from time to time when her diary manager, manager wasn't in, um, definitely did a lot of stuff on her social media profile as well. Um, and at the time as I was working, um, as I was working for Teresa, um, I got the opportunity to apply to um, 
attend the Bernie Grant Leadership Program. So I applied and I got in. And honestly, the three or four days that I spent um, on the program truly, truly revolutionized the way I saw myself, um, the way I saw myself as a young leader in my constituency, but just more generally. Um, and I just became just so much more vocal um, about my politics, where I stood. Um, I began writing articles um, on areas that I was really in. Um, and just to echo Imran as well, like, you know, when I was in parliament, there's I had I, I adopted this mentality if you don't ask you don't get and so I would do really extreme things like um, ask MPs for their time to talk to me about you know their journey and how they got to where they got to um, and give me advice um, I remember sitting down with Lisa Landy one time I was lucky because we shared an office so that wasn't as random um, but uh, you know having a really good conversation with Lisa where she was basically you know telling me about her journey and how she got to where she got to and giving me really top tips about how to craft myself um, as a young politician on the up so to speak I, I wouldn't describe myself as that but um, you know that was something that I think is definitely important it's when you're in parliament even if you're as a parliamentary researcher just network parliament can be a very lonely place and I think for the first three or four months I was probably very lonely because I went from an organization of like Am Amnesty where I knew everybody and um, everybody was a bit friendly <laughs> to parliament where it's a bit colder and um, you know you walk past people in the corridor and they look over your head and not like at you <laughs> Um, and so I was that weird person that was work, walking around in Port Colour's house saying hi to everybody, literally everybody, and then kind of looking at me like, um, I don't think I know you, but you know, that, that really awkward, like, okay, I'm just going to smile because you're smiling at me. Um, but I just, again, when I was there and I, and I felt, you know, that I had to kind of pave my own way in Parliament a little bit, I um, joined Parley Reach, which was like, it's like the BAME network for for Parliament and I got to meet people there and I attended training sessions where I met other BAME um, um, parliamentary researchers and we just clicked as as you do to be honest um, you know when you're kind of the only person that looks like you in such a big institution you kind of gravitate to people who understand um, some of the the hills and battles that you have to fight and climb and I've had to fight so many both in the charity sector and in Parliament um, and I think I'll probably end it there because I've probably been talking a lot um, and if you have any questions about my experiences in parliament or um, the skills that I think are needed to be a parliamentary researcher fire them at me thank you Zainab and again really interesting to hear kind of that journey that you took to